good to be in the house of the Lord. On a Wednesday night, I was had a horrible headache, just laying in bed, just trying to get through it. Came in a little late. Man, there was trucks parked in the grass. I said, that's on Wednesday night. The devil's in for a bad night. Amen. You can't ever give the devil a day off. They pick on me because I push so hard. Oh, even prayer meeting, we got to scream at God, they tell me. Why we got to push? Why does every service have to be? Why can't we just be like other churches? Why can't we just have a preacher where we come and have a little sermon and go home? Well, because I still believe that when a man dies, Brother Tommy, I don't think it's a game. I believe that after you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. It's not a game. Paul said, you know, we don't, you can, see, you can be seated, we don't, we don't, I'm going to teach on the gifts of the Spirit. We don't, uh, but I'm going to talk here. He says, comfort one another with these words. And he's talking about heaven. Right. Yes. I'm going to tell you, we don't, we don't hardly preach, talk. We don't, the conversation in daily lives is not about heaven. Let me tell you, he talks about heaven. Christians locked up in prison cells. They, that's all they talk about. Come on. They're not, how long can I live on this earth till I, to avoid getting to the next one? They're saying, get me there quick and in a hurry. He said, comfort one another with the words of heaven. But we don't, we don't, we don't want to hear about heaven. But I'm going to tell you, you really want to get everybody ticked off, preach about hell. Well, now, don't bother us. You know, that's what they say. The, the, the world is so troubled, why trouble them with more? That's the message from the pew to the pulpit. You know, you just need to encourage them. It, 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 they're, they're, they're so troubled that to talk about hell would just add to the plate. It's ringing. Can you, can you sense the... But there's, no, no, listen, 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 listen. So we're so comfortable we don't have to be comfort, comforted. But we're so troubled we can't be troubled. Do you see the conflict? What are you? Are you comfortable or are you troubled? I don't, I don't think it's any of that. There's a ring in, in the monitors. I think it is, we just don't want to be bothered with eternity. We want to live in bliss of ignorance. But I want you to know the reason we push and the reason we pray and the reason we do what we do, Eastgate Church, we don't have off services, is because after a man dies, let me tell you, every year, 52 million people die. 52 million people die. You break that down, that's 97 people that die every single minute. From the time we've started church, that'd be about 300 people that have died and gone into eternity. My Bible school professor, Talmud French, he, he did a study. He was very smart. And he said there are 30 million oneness apostolic believers. Now, that doesn't mean they all are baptized in Jesus' name, but that is to believe that all, that they believe there's one God. So taking that high number... 30 million of, of 8 billion it's less than one percentage it's about a fifth of a point that's saved in our world let me tell you you sit here in this on this pew you ought to thank God every day somebody came by didn't sit around and have casual Wednesday night casual Monday night prayer casual Sunday night prayer but somebody got up out of their pew and said it's gonna I'm gonna get them Come on, why we always talk about outreach and soul winning? I'll tell you why, because I believe that there's a heaven and I believe that there's a hell. And, and hell is not purgatory where you burn a few minutes and then get out of it. Hell isn't a place where eventually you work your way out of it. I believe it is forever and for forever. I said it's forever. And forever, where the worm does not die. That means there will be no death there. The place of filth, gnashing of teeth, torment, wailing, screaming, constant trembling. 
The flesh of man will be replaced continually and continually and continually and continually with no, with the greatest horror of it all, perhaps, or one of them being no rescue in time. Time. Can you imagine? See, we, we, it's unfathomable for us to comprehend a place where there is no time. Everything in our lives is dictated by it. It's a, it's a trap, but it's also your escape. I said the same thing that traps you also liberates you. Time. It'll trap you to eight hours on a job, and then the same thing that trapped you with the ring of a bell liberates you. It traps you to a schoolroom, but the same bell clock that's holding you captive for the lecture as it drones on, the time will tick on, and this sermon will end. And once again, time will be your liberator. To fathom and comprehend a place where there will be no time is humanly impossible. If it were comprehensible or understandable by the human mind, if it was mathematical, uh, it could be related in mathematics, if it could be communicated in parables, there would be every individual in Vitor, Texas would be in the house tonight. There would be no need to plead for people to come to prayer meeting. There would be no need to plead for people to worship God. You, you, there, there would need, be no need for, hey, let's push. Because you comprehend that when I go to eternity, there is no rescue in time. There's no alarm clock. Ding, ding, ding. I'm free from hell. It, it, it doesn't happen. There's no dew on the morning grass to dry the parched soul of the man that burns forever. For he is forever damned, forever lost. And all the torments of that, well, I, uh, this is not in my notes, obviously, but I feel to, uh, to remind somebody of what we're doing here. And in all the torments of that, the greatest torment of being lost is not the flesh that burns continually, the teeth that eat away the human flesh, the wailing, the weeping, the trembling body, the lack of water, the friendship, the darkness. I think the greatest torment is the mental torment. Can you imagine the mental torment of hell? I think the most mentally tormented people in hell will be those who once knew but I had all that pushing you know it's so pushing he pushes us so hard come on somebody I didn't nobody said anything I just felt it in my spirit sometimes you get a little weary and well doing let me tell you there's some people in eternity that if given two minutes back in time would push themselves to a place you could never imagine While we will be unable to remember and know them. In Luke 16, read it closely. They know you. They know us. This evening, as we sit here, they know. Josh, they remember the memories that will haunt those. The altar calls they could have responded to, you know. But oh, someone hurt their feelings. There's going to be people that burn in hell because somebody hurt their feelings. I've made up my mind I'm not going to hell. And you know what else I've made up my mind? I'm, not, I'm going to get as many people. I don't care how much I don't like them. Nobody deserves to go there. So Brother Duke Sherman, I'm going to work as hard as I can, as long as I can. I'm going to pray as hard as I can. I'm going to worship as much as I can. You say, it doesn't take all that. Maybe it doesn't take all that. But you know what? Uh, I don't want to die at the end of my life, enter into eternity, reflect back and say, man, I could have given just another drop. But as Paul, let me say, I spent my life. I spent who I was. I spent all that I was. What you're doing is valuable. What we're doing in the advancement of righteousness is more than just building the biggest church in our city for bragging rights. We're doing more than winning theological debates. We're doing more than just, come on, I see Brother Coots, God's blessing your business. It's more than just having business and making money. It's about re rescuing souls. That's what, that's what the Bible says. Pulling them from the flames of fire. He said, some you got to save with fear. And we're in a generation of people that want to be coddled. But on a Wednesday night, I've come to tell somebody that heaven is still real and hell is still hot. And if you ain't right with God, you need to make it right tonight. And if there's somebody at your job you haven't told, they're lost, dying, and going to hell, and you're responsible.
You only imagine the person that burns forever next to somebody that didn't tell them. I'm going to tell you, of all people that can't be lost, it's us. You, you, we will be hell's trophy. Huh. We will be mocked of them all. You knew? You went to Wednesday night Bible study? <laughs> and then, can you imagine the anger from those desperate souls? Who will their anger be turned to? To those who never told them. That's why there's a prayer meeting going on tonight in that place we call hell. And that prayer meeting goes something like this. God, please send, send them to my father's house. Get them to soul winning. That's the only prayer hell's praying right now. Is be soul winning, church. Push a little harder. Pray a little longer. Put preacher, preacher. Why does this have to just be something you talk about before the sermon? This should be the whole sermon, every sermon, every sermon. You should, t that's what they, if, hey, if you, if you had somebody came back from hell as your pastor, they would preach one sermon and one sermon alone. You don't want to be lost. You don't want to be lost. So I've just got to remind us on a Wednesday night to, under the unction of the Holy Ghost that whatever's weighing down, I know life, it's weighed on me today, heavy. But I've come with a reminder that I'm going to be saved. I'm not going to be lost. And I'm going to wreck hell on hell come on I'm going to I'm going to unleash a soul winning campaign like never before let's have revival let's push let's push let's be reminded what we're doing here come on ladies and gentlemen I know it's Wednesday night we're going to do this little Bible study but the mission of this moment the mission of the church is much grander greater and of far greater significance than anything happening in time. So push. Push me, Pastor. There ain't gonna be one person up in heaven that says, Oh, I, you know, I regret you 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 pushing us a little bit. There ain't gonna be nobody. Come on. You don't have to do all that. I ain't gonna be nobody gets up to heaven and says, Man, I tried too hard to get here. <laughs> ain't gonna be one person. I believe they're going to dance up to you. Come on. That young lady you encouraged, Mama. And you told her, come on, girl, keep it on the, the straight and narrow. And you kind of patted him on the said, hey, 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 bud, get up in that. You, you, you know you ain't right. You're going to run up to those people and grab them by, the, by, by the, the body and wrap your arms around them and say, thank you, Jesus, uh, that you love me enough to care about my eternity. Come on, it's time to fire it up. It's time to stay on fire. When are we going to let off the gas? We're never letting off the gas. When are we going to let up? We're never going to let up. But, Come on, our mission isn't to have church like everybody else. It's to get people out of hell and into heaven. And whatever we have to do to do that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the money. We got second mile. Don't you love second mile? Man, I love it. We, we're bussing in kids. Come on. Seth said, Pastor, we've filled up this van and we, second mile's filling up their vans and We've got kids we're leaving on the corner. And uh, I thought, well, I got to build a building. <laughs> you know what I mean? He said, I got this deal, this incredible deal for 27000 We can buy this 15-passenger van. And that is a killer deal. I shop. It's kind of one of the pastor things you know what 15-passenger vans cost. You know, it's one of the uncool things I know. I'm like, man, that's a good deal. I've shopped those things. I thought, man, that's a lot. It's not a, that's not a cool purchase when you're trying to build a new sanctuary. You know what I mean? When you're trying to build cool things. But then the Lord spoke to me and said, let me tell you, if you buy, spend 27000 and one baby gets to go to heaven instead of hell, you spend the money. Do you have the money? I said, we've got the money. He said, spend the money. Well, that might take a little longer to get this plan bought that we have to get this permit paid for. Okay, well, you know what? Take a little longer. We'll cram in because it might get hot, but the heat in this house is nothing compared to what would happen if we're lost. So let's get them to heaven. I say we, come on, let's get them to heaven. Come on, Brother Chris, let's get them to heaven. Push, 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 because I believe in this. Ah, I believe. I believe with all my heart in eternity. It's what that's so to answer all the questions, if you ever wonder, that's why I drive and push us so hard. I'm not in a competition. 
I am. I should say that I am in a competition against the devil. I'm out to get every single soul from him. I'm on a mission to destroy his kingdom. That is my goal. My mission, I'm living for it. And in, to the last breath, I'll be witnessing to whoever it is that's t- changing my adult diaper. <laughs> whoever it is, come on. It's there when my last, last breath is taken. I hope I'm saying you got to get to that church and get baptized in the name of Jesus. I love this truth. I believe it works. Amen. I believe it works. I don't just believe it works. I've got evidence that it works. This, this thing works, Sister Jaleesa. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. I'll go quickly. Uh, it's a question that we have quite commonly. Um, and, and last week I talked about the history of the Trinity. And, and we're going into the month of faith. And so the next month of September will be filled with much preaching, um, inspirational, faith building uh, but I, I, I love to, to learn one of the things that as we grow that we must learn about is, is understanding the gifts of the spirit we talked about it a little bit in MIT last night several questions and then uh, there's always some questions on this so I'm going to read quickly um, for the sake of time I will just read down through uh, verse 11 12, I was going to read all the way in. Your homework assignment would be to read through verse 31, but uh, since I did a lot of uh, advertising on the front end, amen? Preliminary remarks. Praise the Lord. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. God, God in, 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 in doesn't want you to say, stay stupid. Okay? Ignorance is not an excuse. Well, I didn't know. Well, you don't know the speed limit. You still have to pay the fine. It's your job to know. Somebody said, well, you need to teach us this and you need to teach us that. Let me tell you the difference with the generation that preceded this one is that they studied to show themselves. There is no way possible that in a a lifetime in a pastorate and three services that I a week can teach you every principle in that book. Literally, I couldn't teach you every principle in the book of Genesis alone. Every word, every dot, every, every, every line is of value to it. And so what you have to do is go home and say, well, I, you know what, I'm just going to whack my hair off because he ain't taught me how, why we don't do it. No, get your own Bible. <laughs> Study to show yourself approved. That's what Paul said. you gotta, you got to go home and study for yourself. Amen? My job is to make, make, give you a little salt. So you're so thirsty, you go home like, man, come on. Sometimes the Lord across this desk will say things that you're like, ooh, I don't know if I agree with that. Instead of getting a bad attitude and getting with your bitter people on the internet, get your Bible. Read your Bible and be a better Christian. And you might just find out that, 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 that the preacher was wrong. You ain't gonna know if you don't read your Bible. And I'm going to tell you something. There's one thing I'm not going to do, and that's miss, my, miss he- heaven over for anybody. I don't, don't miss heaven because of me. So, well, I just trust you. I don't trust. I'm, I'm going to find out for myself. Come on, man. I'm going to go buy a blender. I read 6,000 reviews about the blender, Joey. Come on, some of y'all are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You're reading, you're reading re- internet reviews about toothpaste. I got review readers. I hear them laughing right now. You know, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy this toothpaste and this brand of toilet paper. Come on, you know more about the toilet paper you use than you do the Bible you hold. Come on, somebody. You, you, sh- you ought not to ever. Come on. There, there, there ought to be nothing you know more about than this thing right here. I, I, I'm, on, I'm just going to talk to you from my heart tonight. You, there ought to be nothing in your life that you have greater expertise on than this book right here. Because at the end of the day, whatever it is that you've educated yourself concerning manufacturing, construction, building, business, come on, design, paint, uh, it's not going to do you any good. The word of the Lord will last forever. So don't be ignorant. And any preacher that wants to keep you ignorant, that's not a good thing. You know, come on. That's why church has got to have some teaching. 
You know that you were Gentiles, carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give unto you understanding that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God called Jesus cursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's a great verse, by the way. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Look at your neighbor and say, with all. For to one is given by the spirit of uh, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another di diverse kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the same self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Then he goes into explaining the body. You can be seated, the body, and how that it has many members, but it's joined together as one body. And then verse 28, I will read those last few. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, teachers, after that miracles, then gifts. Somebody say gifts. Yes. Healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues, okay? And, um, and so Paul says here in Corinthians, he's speaking in the church of Corinth about the, the, the gifts of the, the Spirit. The first 10 verses, he delves into nine, nine gifts of the Spirit and kind of really spends some time there. So we'll jump in there very quickly. And then in verse 28, he jumps in and mentions a few other gifts. Uh, in Ephesians, he mentions that some are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Verse 10, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. And so we see that these gifts that God gives, the, the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Peter 4 and 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, that, that word ministry there just means serve. Okay? That is literally, the, 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 matter of fact, some translations, some of your modern translations say, if any serve. And, and it's actually maybe more uh, easily understood because the modern definition of minister is just what I'm doing with a microphone. But anytime you are serving, you are in ministry. Okay, so he says, if any, and, and that's a, a gift that you are a servant to the kingdom of God, okay? And so sometimes there's some confusion on the gifts of the Spirit, especially as we begin to grow and, and people, they misunderstand the, the gifts of, of the Spirit. Um, the first thing that I want you to know about the gifts of the Spirit is that they are to profit with all. Look at your neighbor and say, the gift in me is not for me. Okay, so the benefit of the gifts of the Spirit, and this is probably the primary place where you see abuse of the gifts of the Spirit, is that they are turned and used for the advancement of the individual. Okay, it is not that any of us may glory in ourselves. But the reason that God gifted you with any of these gifts is for the advancement and the good of the body of Jesus Christ. He is specifically talking here. This is specifically to the church body, the church family, you and me, us together, okay? And so it profits all of us. It edifies all of us. When you are used by God in uh, a form of a gift, the next thing you need to do is be very careful the next day, you need to pray like you've never prayed. The enemy has a good way of coming in and using pride to puff you up pretty big and high. Amen? After 1 Corinthians 12, you get 1 Corinthians 11, which is love. It's all about if you have love, you have this, and you don't have love, blah, 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 blah. Okay, love is really the foundation, I believe, that we build the gifts of the spirits on. If you love the body of Jesus Christ, amen, it'll open doors for God to use you in an amazing way. First part of 1 Corinthians 11, these mentions of nine gifts, and we chop them into three segments to understand. If you're taking notes, the first one segment, the three first gifts we separate into know, knowing gifts. The next ones are speaking gifts, and the next three that Paul covers in these, these few verses here are doing gifts. The word of wisdom is the first one. This is a word of wisdom. Now, does that mean that that some people are wise in the church, uh, but the Capaldi and the rest of us are all ignorant. No. No, matter of fact, James chapter 1 and 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, okay? 
Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Okay, it is not God's will that there's a select three people that are wise and the remaining uh, group of us know nothing and we're all dependent upon them, okay? That, that's not the way it's to be. Each of us should seek wisdom from the Lord, okay? However, there will be those that have the gift of wisdom, okay? A word of wisdom. And this will be wisdom that is beyond natural. It'll be a word... Uh, that is divine, I should say it's a wisdom, a knowledge, something to know that is divine, supernaturally imparted from God to that individual. It's a gift of the word of wisdom, and it's, it's above natural understanding. The word of wisdom, here, it supernaturally uh, gives people an understanding of the situation that you're in, and God reveals his mind to us in this moment, okay? Now, I want you to know that it's the word of wisdom. It is not the person it's important, okay? It's, and it's also word, not even situation. Oftentimes, it is an insight for a single, just a single insight for right there. Not the whole picture, not the whole thing, just a, a word of wisdom. It doesn't even say words, plural. Come on. Okay? So I, I think it's just uh, important to know that that word is going to come in and it's going to know, uh, give you wisdom. Has anybody ever had somebody that operated in a word of wisdom? That it, there it is. Amen. There's someone right here. That, that someone, there it is. And let me tell you where normally these things take place. Okay. Been doing this a few years. Dad, dad, no, I've got, man, I've got about 10 years of experience right here. I don't want to give away y'all's age, but we got a lot of experience on this front row right here. Uh, in dog years, it's probably 100,000 years. Amen. I don't know. We're not going to talk human years though. Let me tell you where the gifts of the Spirit that in my experience, where God, and God is, I've had it, a, a, a word of knowledge where I'm going to tell you, I did not know situations where there was, I needed a divine knowledge, direction. Inevitably in my life, they have happened at the altar call. Is there anybody else that say, yeah, I've, 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 I've had the, there it is. Okay, I see hands going up. Okay, all across, right here. Right. Okay, once again, you'll see why Pastor Tuttle's always pressing you First of all, I'm trying to get you here because if you have a spiritual gift, this is probably where it's going to be used. It's kind of like if you're a, a, a doctor and you can do emergency surgery and this is the ER and there's people bleeding all over the place and y'all sitting back there like this. That's just immaturity. And, and so when I'm pulling people at the altar call and I'm, you feel like, man, Pastor might be a little frustrating me. Yeah, you've been in church 20 years and you still don't respond to the altar call. What you are is immature. Don't, don't come and bring your pedigree and say, I've been in church 20 years. If you've been in church 20 years and don't respond to altar calls, you're an immature. You might have been here a long time, but you ain't grown. Your growth is evident in how you treat the broken. Does that make sense? And each of us have a gift. So what we're doing at the altar, what we're doing here, and this is Wednesday night Bible study. I'm teaching you. Come on. So that kind of hurts, but it's kind of right. And what you need every once in a while is to be poked and be reminded that God gifted you with something for who? With all. So when we're in the house, who's it about? Ministry is to serve. And if you're here on Wednesday night, you have been called into the ministry. And the ministry is the service of the people of God and the broken in our world. Does that make sense? And so a word of knowledge can be given, amen, and, and you can uh, allow God to, to do just that, a word of knowledge. Then there is the discerning of spirits, the discerning of spirits. I'm, gonna, I'm going quickly. I'm just passing through. I'm going to jump just because I don't have a lot of time. I hate that. The gifts of discerning of spirits. This is a supernatural ability to know if a spirit or a spiritual work is of God or of Satan or of human nature, okay? First John 4 and 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try. That means to discern or examine them, okay? The spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, okay? It is called the discerning of spirits, not the gift of discernment, okay? Some people call this the gift of discernment, but it's actually the discerning of spirits, and that spirit in particular is in reference to humanity. Okay? It's in reference to the spirit of two primary things that the discerning of spirits is operating and used for. 
identifying false prophets, identifying wolves in sheep's clothing. To understand what is going on here with this individual. Try the spirit. Know them that labor among you. And realize, hey, th there's something off here. My, my spirit senses something's off here. Someone said, how do I know if it's a wolf? What do they eat? If whoever you hang out with eats people, you're hanging out with a wolf. Because sheep eat the word of the Lord and grass. Sheep are timid and mild, but if you hang out with people, I, I can tell you about them. I can tell you about them. Let me tell you. About them. Come on, somebody. And the wolf's number one adversary is always the shepherd. Their favorite meal is the pastor. Come on. False prophets can be identified and typically by what they're saying, and they typically are not submitted. The non-denominational movement that's sweeping across this is a scary thing. With, is, come on. I know they beat up, oh, you're part of the UPC. They don't have enough accountability. Then they join a non-denom. <laughs> Sin is stupid. <laughs> I, not enough accountability over the UPC so I'm going to go over here to the non-denoms where there's zero accountability come on somebody so, so there, there's kind of how you can and, and your spirit is going to something's off you know, you know anybody know what I'm talking about okay that, that God is that's not just random God is giving discernment of spirits there amen so that we can hear the true voice of God John 10 and 4 says and when he the good shepherd putteth forth his own sheep he goeth before them, and I'm, I'm using ESV, I think. I'm sorry, NIV. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. you got to know the voice, amen? Through the discerning of spirits, we see that Paul knows a, a young girl in Acts chapter 16 is possessed with an evil spirit and was able to cast it out. She said, okay, this is not her. This is a demonic spirit, okay? And so you'll be able to discern... Uh, that, that, uh, that spirit in what, what you're fighting it'll help you in prayer too you know am I fighting flesh or is this some people every, everything's the devil and some people everything's their neighbor that's why you need the gift of discerning of spirits it's not all your wife sometimes maybe they, you know it could be an evil spirit involved it might not be your husband it might be an evil spirit getting in there come on trying to divide your family and you need the gift of discerning of spirits amen uh, there is, I'm going quickly, the gift of prophecy. Uh, this is an anointing utterance, an anointed utterance uh, from God. It can be foretelling or forthtelling. So prophecy is either forthtelling, that is to proclaim or to exhort, to announce a message uh, under the inspiration of God. I believe that every time you hear preaching from the word of the Lord, uh, that you're hearing somebody operate in the gift of prophecy, which is the forthtelling, uh, the witnessing uh, of God's word. Then there is foretelling, and that is to proclaim or announce an event that has not yet occurred. Anybody ever had somebody give you a word of prophecy that was foretelling? They gave, said, hey, this is going to happen, and you need to watch out for this. Amen. I see hands going up across the bit, and it came to pass. Amen. It, aren't you thankful for the gifts of the Spirit? I've had it only happen once in my life. Someone said, hey, here's something uh, that you need to watch out for, and, uh, and, and warned me about it, and sure enough, came to pass, and uh, I was able to avoid some trouble there. Thank God for the church. No wonder the devil don't want you in the church. You get words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Come on, you get discernment of, discerning of spirits. And, and then you have, of course, the words of prophecy, okay? And then we have uh, diverse kinds of tongues. Now, um, speaking in tongues is a supernatural experience that takes place when you are born again of the Holy Spirit. If you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you spoke with other tongues, Okay, so this, is, this does not mean that if you, uh, a lot of people confuse this here, the, the, the gift of tongues with the initial sign. And I've explained that to you when I taught the initial sign. But just reiterating that here, that just like everybody has to pursue after wisdom, doesn't mean everybody has the gift of wisdom. Okay, just because some people have the gift of tongues doesn't mean others don't speak in tongues. That makes sense? Okay. 
So speaking in tongues, it's a supernatural utterance. And this is the one probably that if you were a new convert and it happened, it freaked you out a little bit. How many remember you, you're not born in Pentecost and you remember your first tongues and interpretation? All right, hands go. So you all remember it. <laughs> Look at how many hands going up. And how many of you are like, oh my goodness, what is going on? All right, hands are going up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so we have new people coming in. That's why we teach on the gifts of the Spirit to let you know that what is taking place in that setting is an individual being used uh, by the Holy Ghost uh, to give a message, a word in an unknown tongue. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2 says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. 14 and 4 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Okay? But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And so Paul is very clear that when the gift of tongues goes forth, that there has to be someone with the gift of interpretation of tongues. So the gift of tongues can go forth Paul says two, no more than three times, okay? And, and, and that would be even for the message. So it's not like we all get in here and, and he gives a gift to tongues and he interprets, he gives gifts and tongues, he inter and we spend all night in here ting -tong, like ping pong balls, okay? Two times, third time, and then if there's no one to interpret, that's the responsibility of whoever's directing the service to say, let's continue on in worship, Amen. That doesn't mean that the person that gave the tongues was out of the Holy Ghost. Doesn't mean that they missed it. It just means that there wasn't someone present with the gift of interpretation of tongues. Or it could mean that the person with the gift just didn't have the confidence. Okay? We're not beating them up. Amen? That's fine. Well, how do I know if it's of God? I feel to speak. Well, if, if, here's what you need to ask yourself. Does it upbuild, the, uplift the church? Does it edify the church? God is never going to use the gift of tongues to say, Thus saith the Lord, you are a horrible human being. He's not going to use a gift of tongues to beat down his body. The only person that corrects the church, I believe, happens from behind this pulpit. I'm going to say that again. The only correction that the body receives is from behind the pulpit. There is, extra, there is a place to be corrected and reprimanded, but it is not from a peer. I'm going to say that again. I don't really even like, appreciate, and I ask that our guest ministry is not here to correct you. If they feel something's off, they tell me. It is my duty and responsibility. Correcting is not, there's not a parent in this room that's like, woohoo, I got to spank my kid. My, Lewis, it's funny, wasn't it, babe? We're sitting at dinner the other night. He's like, so dad, what, what was the favorite spanking you've ever given? <laughs> Didn't he ask that? And I'm like... What are you talking about? He's like, it's that time you got me 50 times, isn't it? I'm like, no, no, no. I said, dude, I said, I've never. There's not a parent in this room. If you are, you, got, you need to get up here and pray through. There's not a pastor worth his weight that truly loves people that's like, yeah. As a matter of fact, it's seldom planned. It's unction of the Holy Ghost, typically. Amen, that just... And then you walk off and you feel like the same, like you do after you spank your kids. You're like, oh God, I'm the worst ever. You know? So let me just make that, let's just stay right there. I'm gonna say it again. I don't care who you are, what your title is, how long you preached at your other church. You don't correct my sheep. <laughs> Keep your paws, hands, mouth off my sheep. If they need to be taken care of, I'll take care of it. And if you don't think they're holy enough, I'll answer to God for them. That's my responsibility, okay? So just stay away. Stay away. And so if you're so using the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues to abuse the sheep, amen, would be wrong. So if it's edifying, say it. Well, what if it's not of God? Well, it's definitely not of the devil. And if it's, I'm going to tell you, I'll take a compliment even if it's off. You're like, man, pastor, you got a great head of hair. I'm, you're a little off, but I'll take it. I'll take it. I, nobody's ever died because they got over-encouraged. You know what I mean? Well, why are they here? Well, they just encouraged them to death. <laughs> but there's people that have taken guns and blown their brains out. 
because they weren't encouraged enough. Let it never be said of us that we didn't encourage enough. And it isn't. Well, I'm going to tell you, y'all are encouraging. Y'all make me feel good about myself. So it's a good life. Amen. And then he says, let it be done decently and let it be done in order. Okay. So the gift of, of tongues and the interpretation of it is to be done uh, in, in order. It is the gift of interpretation, not the gift of translation. Okay. So what are you saying? I'm saying that that the, the interpretation of what God is speaking is the theme, not a word for word. So you may hear someone that speaks in tongues for 13 minutes and the interpretation is 13 seconds. You're like, hold on now, just a second. I heard a whole lot more words over there in the Greek sounding language than I did in the English sounding language. It's because they, God is giving the theme, not a word for word. He gives the idea, meaning that he will use the old hick country boy to talk in his language. You, you don't have to, thine and thou, you can. I understand if you read the Bible in, 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 in the King James Version, you connect those words to how God speaks to you. I'm not belittling that. I'm just saying if you're, just, if you're a country boy, country girl, whatever, and the Lord speaks to you and says, thus saith the Lord, God is good. He is for you. You're going to make it, and God's going to bless you, and, and whatever, however you say it in your slang, however you say it, not slang, but keep it you know, modest, but in your, in Vidorian, God understands Vidorian. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said God understands your language. Don't be afraid of it, okay? Don't be afraid to let God use you. And, uh, and I'm so thankful for those that open themselves up to these various gifts. And, and we, want all, uh, we want them to be in motion and activated in our lives. Now I'll say this, you can go to heaven. You don't have to have all nine gifts of the Spirit to go to heaven. But you need to have the fruit of the Spirit to go to heaven. You got to have them, amen? And the gift of healing, the gifts of healing, okay? When the gifts of healing are in operation, God miraculously removes the cause of disease, affliction, and healing takes place. This is something that happens supernaturally. Now, does that mean that we, as all believers, do not have the right to pray for the sick? No. Mark 16, 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Okay, there's other, uh, James chapter 5, he says, if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Amen. Let them anoint with oil and the prayer of faith is prayed over them. And, uh, and so the, the healing in the body can take place through various avenues that, uh, that God chooses. But there are people that God specifically gifts with the gift of healing. And God will use them in prayer. Again, it's not to take credit for themselves, but it is for uh, the body of Jesus Christ. I'm going quickly. The gift of working of miracles. This gift is an activation of God's power and it, it happens immediately. A supernatural event. Uh, amen. It, 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 it'll, it'll, it, 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 it's, it's a body that's healed. It's a life uh, that's perhaps spared. It's jobs that have been acquired. I wrote down a few of your babies that have been born. I believe my mother was a, a, a witness. I told that testimony. Wasn't supposed to have children, but uh, Brother T.W. Barnes prayed for it. Amen. Had, obviously had the gift of the miraculous. Had, uh, he was very used in the gifts of spirit. Thank God for it. I wouldn't be here. Y'all are like, oh, man. You know, some are like, I wish T.W. Barnes would have never prayed for her. You know, I, I'm just kidding. It's all right. I'm here anyway. Marriages have been saved because somebody prayed with the gift of, of, of the miraculous. Amen. Uh, financial needs have been met because of the working of miracles. People have been brought back to life from the dead because of the working of miracles. The gospel has been preached in places perhaps unreachable, but because of the working of miracles, uh, it was able to happen. And so thank God for the church. Amen. I don't need the church. Man, you're missing out on a lot of great things. A lot of, lot of great, great things. Let me say this, that all these giftings are pushing anyone that's lost to the cross. They're pushing them to, uh, to Calvary and to uh, salvation. Of course, there's the gift of faith, the gift of faith. Now, does that mean that some of us don't have to believe? No. Without faith, it's impossible to come to God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Amen. And so we as believers must each and every one of us have faith. As each and every one of us must speak with other tongues. 
but there will be some that have a gift of faith, a gift to, that activates faith within someone else. I believe that most preaching, that preachers operate in the gift of prophecy and most operate in the gift of faith. How many of you have ever come to church? You're feeling a little low, amen? But after the preaching, your faith was full, amen? How, how many of you have got some people that if you're feeling low, you call them and say, let's go to lunch? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And you know after that lunch, you're going to be like, give me a lasso, show me the moon. I'm bringing it down to, for my wife as a Christmas present. I, I, mean, I can do anything through Christ. Just tell me where to go. I'm going. You, them people. That's the gift of faith that operates through them, that boosts you know, people that perhaps are struggling to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Find somebody with a gift of faith, and God will operate through them, and they'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen? My time is up. I'll finish it later. But Mark 8 and 11 says this. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, Jesus, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. A wicked, he says in 16 and 4 of Matthew, an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. What I want to make very clear to you is that we are not in the pursuit of the sign. Come on. Well, I'm going to go over there because so-and-so, uh, you know, is healing them. We don't follow people and ministries because of the, the giftings that they have. Come on. Be, I said, don't. Don't do it. Someone once told me, he said, well, well, I'll tell you what, the way you have revival is you have a bunch of dead people get up. Now, what you'll have is a bunch of news media. But if, if raising dead people and healing all the sick is how you had big revival and nothing bad ever happened, Jesus would have never got killed. But the same people he healed killed him. Come on. I've prayed for people. I have. I've prayed for people, brought, brought them back from the dead only to see them walk away. You'd have never thought. I've prayed for people with tumors in their heads and God healed their tumor and they still walk away. Come on, somebody. How does that happen? I'll tell you why. Not because they didn't experience the miraculous. That'll wear off. It'll wear off. You'll, you, you'll, you'll just get a little ways down the road. It'll be like, well, that was great. But I'm going to tell you what you never forget is if you have a love for the truth. Brother Trimble, if you have a love for truth, you got to love truth. I want to get it into this church and the DNA of who we are, that we love the truth. We are preacher. You don't have to get up there and tell a bunch of faith stories. To get us, what I love about Eastgate, they don't have to come in here and tell a bunch of stories. They just come in here and preach the word. Faith comes by hearing. You don't have to, it's cool to know what's going on in Bangladesh, but my faith grows when you get up and start preaching the word. Because I'm going to be honest, when I'm hearing about what's going on in Bangladesh, I'm here thinking, well, that's not doing me no good. Come on, somebody. Preach the word and get faith into my heart because I need it to happen in Viter. Come on. And, and, and we're mature enough that we don't have to, come on, we don't follow signs. We don't need 13 faith stories, one, two, three, shout hallelujah to get healed. No, you can get up here and say the Bible said. You can be, God said. Well, I've never seen it. Doesn't matter. My faith is not, come on, made based upon anything other than the word of God. I'm not bashing it. I'm just, I'm, tell all the faith stories. I've got them. Overcome them by the word of the Lamb and the, the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. But you don't need it. Come on, you, just because you've never experienced a miracle doesn't mean you can't witness one. That's a lie from the damnable hell. Come on, just because you've never been healed doesn't mean you can't lay your hands on somebody and says the word of God. Just because you've never seen anybody raised from the dead doesn't mean that you can't lay your hands on somebody dead. Joey, you can raise him from the dead. Come on, I can see blinded eyes open for myself. I believe it with all my heart. With all my heart. Hallelujah. A few that I didn't hit, but there's two that we mentioned. Helps. The gift of helps. We never talk about that one. But it's a gift of the Spirit. And it means the gift of relief. I'll tell you, that's a gifting of the Spirit. Somebody that just brings relief. I want you to know there's people that come into this church Saturdays. They come in all throughout the week and they just pick up trash. 
What drew you in here? Why were you doing that? That was the gift. That was a gift. Some of it brings the water. Some of it opens the door. You're not just doing that. There's something in you that wants to do it. That's draw Can I get an amen? Brother David, you, he, you're the head usher. Why? Because there's something in you that wants to be the head usher. And that's as valuable as somebody giving a message in tongues. Matter of fact, without helps, the doors aren't open. So we can have interpretation of tongues. So if we're maybe putting them in order, I say thank God for the helps. I love that one. I love, he says, the gift of administrations or governments. It's another gift that if you are an admin, Joseph was a, op, he operated in the gift of administration, save the world. And so uh, the gifts of the spirit, the gift, if you are a gifted administrator, that's a gift. I, I love that things are done decently in order at Eastgate. They're done under the administration. There's administration at Eastgate. We can only grow as we stand together. We can only grow as big as we can administer. Does that make sense? Joseph understood I'm going to have to build huge barns because we're going to have huge revival. But that's going to take every person working within the structure of the system. If someone was to speak out in tongues and another was to speak out in another tongue and another was to jabber over here, I would get up and say this is not in order because it is against the, the flow. We would all agree with that, amen? That's against the flow. Okay, it's the same as somebody that says, I'm bigger than the system. I don't have to fill out event request forms. I don't have to go through that system. I'm, it's just as out of order as it is on the other side because we can only grow as big as the system. And if every individual has to have a personal prayer cloth from me, we can only grow to about where we're at. I'm just going to talk to you from my heart. If every one of you has to have a personal visit every time you get an ingrown toenail, I'm, by me, this is it. Does that make sense? So when the system is working and the elder comes by to pray for you, come on somebody, here's where you get power is when you recognize by submitting to the system, come on, I can be healed. Because when, come on, I don't have the gift of healing. Let's say Stevie does. If you've got cancer, who you want praying for you? Come on, somebody. You don't care who it is. You just want to be healed. And you trust the system. Am I right? You trust that if God's given him the gift of healing, get your hand as quick as you have on this head and get this cancer up out of my body. It is the same with church growth, church revival, and church principles. We have to trust this. We have to have the same faith in the systems that God has. And so he establishes church government, and that's why we have to have church government. Does that make sense? So don't, don't, as we grow, don't get offended as systems change because we can only grow the size of the system and the systems were put together by God he told God God told us how to do it he laid out the plan but the loft and here's how you have church government here's how you set it up you have a pastor you have elders you have deacons you have presbyters over your and, we, and we're setting it up that way does that make sense and I believe that Pentecost has been robbed from great harvest because of the, the, the gift of government is overlooked because we all want to have a personal touch. Come on to Jesus. Well, I know. I, I want to be up there with Peter too. But baby, if I'm in the days of the disciples, I'm like, hey, wherever I've got to serve, just put me in that place. I want to have revival. And that is the spirit of Eastgate Church. The spirit of Eastgate Church is wherever i got to serve, put me there. Why don't you just lift your hands, lay your hand on somebody. Amen. If you need healing, amen, lift your hand quickly. Lift your hand quickly. Uh, amen. Come on, if you know that God has used you before in healing, I want you to find somebody and pray over them. We won't be long. Uh, come on, if you need a way to be made with
where there is no way. Uh, come on, an impossible situation. The, a believer is going to lay his hands on you right now. You're in a, come on, you're in a church that is spirit filled, spirit activated. Uh, but by this shall they know, uh, come on, uh, that you're my disciples, you love one another. Uh, by their fruit, you, not by the gifts of the Spirit, but by their fruit, I pray God for an activation of love, peace, and joy. Uh, I pray, Lord, that long suffering God uh, would get a hold uh, he, uh, of patience and meekness, uh, kindness, gentleness, self control. Uh, God, as we've preached about the gifts, I pray, Lord, also for the fruit. Uh, God, I pray, Lord, that you would open the minds of us, uh, your children. Uh, give me wisdom, godly wisdom, uh, to lead according to your word, uh, to guide according to the government, dear God, that you have in your word, uh, so that we can have revival in this last day, uh, that we can pull, as it were, from the flames of eternal hell, those that are lost, uh, that we can be changed and transformed by the power of your word. Uh, in the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Uh, and everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a great praise on a Wednesday night. Hallelujah. Be mindful. Next week we continue with our regular church service schedule. The following week after we will jump into Sunday morning. Sunday.